Michelle Prince, founder and CEO of Performance Publishing Group, making a difference one story at a time. We'll be shining the light on successful founders, entrepreneurs, business owners, and leaders that are getting results and making a difference. We'll talk about how they built their businesses, are creating movements, and leveraging the power of authority in their own lives. Be sure to stick around to the end of the show and we'll reveal how you can be our next guest. Let's get started. Hey everybody, Michelle Prince here, host of the Power of Authority Spotlight, where we shine the light on incredible business owners, founders, entrepreneurs, people that are doing great things, building businesses, claiming their authority, and making a difference along the way. Um, we're going to be diving into our, our guest here in just a minute. But first, this episode is brought to you by Performance Publishing. Performance Publishing provides done-for-you publishing services for soon-to-be authors. Everybody has a book and every story matters. And it is one of the greatest ways to utilize your authority and use it as your business card. So if you want to learn more, grab a free strategy call at performancepublishinggroup.com. That's performancepublishinggroup.com. All right, let me introduce you to Alicia Barr. She is a woman in a male-dominated industry who is calling out the common lies perpetrated in sales, primarily the lie that you have to do things that feel weird to win sales and experience hundreds of reps and rejections before you can be good at sales. The truth is nothing is one size fits all, especially not something as dynamic and unpredictable as sales. She loves giving people a refreshing alternative, the matchmaker's sales method, because if it's a fit, it's a fact, and there is no selling involved. Alicia enjoys giving people permission to lean into their personal strengths instead of acting like someone else. In her experience, it always sells more. She's also the host of the Sales is Not a Dirty Word podcast. Welcome to the show, Alicia. Thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here, Michelle. I'm excited too, because, uh, well, one, I love just talking to business owners and founders like you, and especially women. Um, but also the whole sales thing. I mean, everybody I know, and we talked a little about this before the show began, is everybody thinks sales is a dirty word and that, you know, we don't want to be salesy and it's cringy. Um, so I, I, I've got to know that. How did you get into wanting to help people with sales? Where What's the backstory on all that? Yeah. So, I mean, I started selling in corporate and I was always just a natural at it. And the thing about people who are natural at sales is they've never had to articulate it before. And um, when someone asks them, you know, well, what do you do? Why are you so good at sales? They say, well, I don't really sell. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what the hell does that mean? Nobody can do anything with that, right? Um, so whenever I left corporate and had my own marketing agency, I, which helps a lot with sales, of course, yeah. the in the trenches marketing experience. But I noticed that there was, a huge gap in sales training available mm -hmm. and that the majority of sales training available is for an aggressive man. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people who are not aggressive men who feel really uncomfortable with that style of selling <laughs> and it's unnecessary. So I, you know, over the past five years have really dialed in the matchmaker sales method and making it not about convincing someone or coercing someone or manipulating someone but instead having criteria for who's a fit and more importantly, who is not a fit yeah. and being able to tell someone that they're not a fit. And that's what a natural seller does. They tell someone, actually, you don't, you don't actually need this solution. You need this other thing. Um, you need to talk to this other person or whatever. They're not only in it for a sale yeah. and you can feel that as a buyer. You know, that is such a great point. I remember I, so my background, I was in software sales. I, well, actually I'll take that back a step. I started my career in sales for Zig Ziglar and I was selling training and development. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's, that's my, my passion, my DNA, everything I do revolves around what I learned from him. But in the, uh, <laughs> I was in my young, early twenties. I wanted to make a, a big, you know, make, make more money, make a name for myself. So I quit Ziglar to go into IT sales and then software sales. And, 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 you know, it was so exciting being in corporate, doing traveling all over and all this. And, but that, that's a whole podcast in and of itself that became mm -hmm. a real grind. And I, you know, definitely it was not my passion, mm. but I remember when I was literally about, or I think I had already given notice to my software job that, uh, you know, it's the last week or two that I gave him and I went out to do a demo or a sales call. And I remember because I had no skin in the game anymore. I wasn't worried about making a sale. 
I literally just went into this meeting and told the man that, you know, basically I was like, we're not a fit for you like this. And, and it was legit. Like it wasn't because yeah. I had no need to make a sale. I didn't have the pressure of quota. It was like, honestly, this isn't a fit. And you know, the funniest thing, he offered me a job. <laughs> that he did because it is so rare for someone to have an experience with a person being honest and it's keeping honest. their best interests yeah. in mind. Is that why sales uh, has such a dirty word? Because there are so many people that is the incentivize, incentivation, or I can't even say the word. Are we incentivized in the wrong way as salespeople, which makes us you know, willing to do whatever to get the sale? Or why is it cringy? I think that it's cringy because of really bad sales training, honestly, because being more upfront with people is going to make more sales. So if people realized that, they would do that more. It's yeah. like the coming from a place of scarcity. It's, um, you know, force fitting things, whether it makes sense or not. It's like the questions that you're asking aren't around somebody being a fit. So you don't even know if somebody's fit. I'm sure everybody's had an experience where they bought something that was not a fit for them mm -hmm. because the person just wasn't upfront about who wasn't a fit or asked questions to uncover whether you were or were not. It was just like, this is going to be a yes if I have anything to do with it. So it's like, really just the lack of an alternative approach, I think, and what's accepted as mainstream. Everybody just says like, this is what you do and they hate how it feels, but nobody knows how to do anything different. So they do it. Right. I, and I love, we're talking about this because one of the things, so we work with a lot of uh, small business owners, entrepreneurs, founders, people that are you know, they're, they've started a business or they've been in business for a while. They're looking to scale. And a lot of times they'll come to us to, they want to write a book because they do see their book as their business card. And so they want to use that book to open doors of opportunities, right? And a lot mm -hmm. of times that's selling themselves. That's selling mm -hmm. themselves as a speaker or as a coach or Absolutely. you know whatever. And I hear it all the time that people say, I could sell anything to anyone. I can sell snow to an Eskimo, but I cannot sell myself. Yeah. What is going on there? Oh my gosh. Can I relate to this? This happened to me, actually. I, I was great at selling my marketing services, but at first when I was selling my, my sales strategy and coaching, I felt really weird. Mm -hmm. And the reason is it's very personal. We are so worried that we're going to promise something that we cannot deliver on. Mm -hmm. And so we want to like give all of these you, you know, there's this lack of confidence in your delivery because you're like, well, I can't, I can't say that for sure. I can't, you know, uh, do, 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 I don't want to, you know, because then I have to be held personally accountable for that result not happening. So what you can do instead is just let someone know what the exceptions are. Just let them know when it doesn't work. The only reason this wouldn't work is if you don't reach out to me for support. Mm -hmm. I cannot babysit you. I cannot reach out constantly checking in on you. Or the only reason this doesn't work is if you don't get me videos and graphics. I can't post anything if you don't send me materials, you know, and like, let them know uh, and let them know like the caveats, like, for example, I've, I've worked with a lot of marketing agencies since that's my background. Mm -hmm. And you need to let them know, is it okay that it takes 90 days, at least 90 days for us to start seeing results? Because we have to trial and error a lot of things. And if you need something to be faster than that, then this is not a fit. And yeah. so like managing those expectations up front really allows somebody to feel more comfortable in saying, okay, if you are these situations, like if you're this fit criteria, then yeah, you, you sound confident. I can do this for you because you know what you can do. You're just so worried about there being some caveat or some whatever, and you have integrity. So that's why you feel weird. <laughs> oh my gosh. You hit the nail on the head because most business speaking for myself too, I didn't get into business because I, I I got into business because I wanted to do something that I was passionate about. I wanted to help people serve people. And so when you start a business around something that you feel very, very passionate about, you one, you would do it for free, you know, if you could, but we can't do that. Um, yeah. And we can't help people if we don't have them invest, I believe. Um, but two, like you, you, your name is around all this. And mm -hmm. you know, it's funny, I, I can so relate. So I started my business in 2009 and I do remember feeling like, I don't want to say I can do something. I always would tell, and I still say this, I will, I don't want to overpromise under deliver. I'd rather do the opposite. And I'd rather mm -hmm. tell you, this is going to like for a, a book, people always want a book tomorrow. 
And the reality is it takes a while to get a book out. So yeah. I'm always going to tell them a very conservative estimate now. But I wonder if that's, and, and in my mind, I'm thinking that's actually a good thing because ultimately, hopefully we'll exceed expectations, but maybe that's not a good thing. And maybe it's being more of that afraid to, you know, say we can or can't do something. I don't know. You just got me thinking. Yeah. Well, I think it's good to let somebody know, like, look, this is the worst case scenario. As long yeah. as you're okay with the worst case scenario, then we're good. And yeah. it's probably going to be better than the worst case scenario. But I just want to like have it all out there. And and that makes the person feel like it's very transparent and they know what they're getting into. And you don't have some weird pressure by giving them. A lot of times people will give the best case scenario in a sales conversation. <laughs> don't right. give the best case scenario. No, no. Because th those seem to always. And, and you know what else I've found? It's almost like those those sales that you try to make work. You know, it's not exactly what you do. It's not your, you know, you tweak it just enough for somebody to make it work for them. Those yeah. always end up being the worst issues and the, the biggest problems because the expectations haven't been really set because it's not the standard service. I'm like, well, but but they don't remember that down the line. Um, so I, I really like what you're saying about managing expectations, setting those things up front. And do you think salespeople don't do that as good as as good of a job as they should because they're afraid to lose the sale? Yes. So I mean, and I think that there's like an epidemic in our society of people pleasing. So people feel really bad telling somebody something that they don't want to hear. <laughs> um, but the truth is they're going to be so grateful for it. And if you are going to go outside your scope, like you're talking about, which happens all the time, especially in the beginning, people are like, well, I can just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. So um, if you are going to do something, you can. Um, then just let them know, like, I don't usually do this. So as long as you're okay with it not being perfect, yeah, we'll include it. Okay, that's a good way to do it. Yeah, so we're just all on the same page. Walk me through a scenario. Let's say, um, let's say there's somebody, I know there's somebody listening right now that has a coaching business and that is definitely, you know, um, uh, you're selling yourself, right? Even though you're yes. selling the service, you're giving them so much value, but to the sometimes to the coach, it feels that way. How, how would you help or, you know, how would you go into a uh, business like that and help them? What would you do first and how would you, how would you work with those? Clients? Yeah. So the thing that's really different about me is that I understand someone's offer inside and out, and then I design a custom sales strategy around it. Oh, yeah. So a lot of times when somebody works with a sales expert, they're just like, this is the way that you do it. And they don't take into consideration the offer or the audience. And somebody selling like a, a health and wellness offer is should have a different approach than somebody selling like a lead generation offer. Right. Yeah, they're different audiences and your approach is always different. So one of my superpowers is understanding what you do and how it's different and then putting it in a very concise sentence so okay. kind of like the elevator pitch in a way or yeah kind of but also like an explanation that the other like sometimes it's longer than a sentence but for the other person to understand the buyer to understand what is it about you so like when you talk about coaches it's really easy for coaches to sound generic mm -hmm. and like they end up focusing on like well you get this many meetings nobody cares about meetings nobody wants meetings they want the result of meetings right. So you're going to dial in their annual plan, um, you know, start laying the groundwork in the first three months and then execute the next three months and adjust as you go for the best results mm -hmm. or something like that. And yes, included with that comes X amount of meetings or whatever. So it's really about explaining the transformation that somebody will go through that gives them like a frame of reference. Like, what are we doing? Like, what can I expect? when I start and when can I expect to be done and what will it look like when I'm done? Mm, that's great advice. Yeah, I think you're right. Most, because we know our, our offers so well, we know, you know, here's how we do it, but, but, but people aren't buying the how they're buying the, the, the end result, the, the, you know, they, they want the, the big shiny, the, the big shiny object, not all the steps it takes to get to that. <laughs> well, not the deliverables. So for you, like for a book publishing offer, it's, you know, we help you. I don't know if you have book, do you do book coaching as part of the offer? Like, do you we help can, them? With we, have a, we have an academy that has like a cohort type. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we guide you on the best way to articulate your message so Mm -hmm. that it makes an impact on your ideal audience. And we think about that before you write anything. And then we edit and organize it so that it's easy for other people to read and publish it so that you can book and give you criteria for booking speaking opportunities or whatever the goal is. So somebody can see like, okay, I start, they help me with that. Then they help me publish it. And then I get speaking, you know, it's like, yeah, you don't have to say like through whatever many meetings or whatever, but you can, you say it at the end. Like it's important to let them know what they get with it. You have a cohort, you have multiple calls, but it's like the smallest part of the explanation because you want to connect like, it doesn't mean anything to them. You have to connect the dots for them of what's happening in these meetings and these cohorts. Oh, good. I love it. So were you, 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 you said your background was in marketing. So is that one of your superpowers of, of writing copy and, and kind of branding type stuff? Would you say? You know, yes, it, it inevitably crosses over. So sales is the art of words. And I mean, so is marketing in a lot of ways. So it's nice because what we put together when we work together absolutely applies to like your website or your social content or whatever. And the the real thing that always shocks people is that I'm able to take something that they take maybe like 10 minutes to say, and then I can give it back to them in one minute and it's much clearer. So that is in written word and in spoken word. And so often people just don't even realize what is different about them. They have unconscious competencies. Like they think, oh, I thought everybody did that or whatever. And so an outside perspective is able to say, oh, this is really different and we should highlight it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And even I looked at your LinkedIn profile and you you do a really, you did a great job of that. Just succinctly saying what you do in that, in that. um, Thank you. Cause I have not been as good at it with myself. That has been an evolution. Trust me. I get it. Trust me. (laughs) We're the same boat. Like we help all these other people to build their brand and their authority and all this. And then it's like, oh, well, don't go to my site because I need to update that. But um, (laughs) yeah. What would you say about, so we're talking about social media, LinkedIn, how important is that in, in the whole sales strategy today? I mean, uh, back in my day, you know, early in my sales career in the nineties, it was picking up the phone or going door to door (laughs) or business to business. But that's different now. How important would you say this is to get really good at that? You know, I mean, there are lots of ways to reach the end goal. So my whole thing is not a one size fits all, right? So if you absolutely hate social media, you don't have to do it. I don't Mm -hmm. think you have to do anything. Um, You do have to do something. So maybe that's like networking Mm -hmm. or maybe it's speaking or maybe it's hosting events or paid advertising or something like that. So you want to pick whatever resonates and feels good to you, because if it doesn't feel good, you're not going to want to do it and you're going to hate it. And if you ever do it, I mean, I just had to do Christmas decorations last weekend and I didn't want to. And I dropped a tree on my toe because I didn't want it. So when you're resentful and you're doing something, it's not going to be quality. Um, So it's really like giving yourself permission to say, yeah, social media works, but I hate it. Or networking works, but I'm do- I'm drowning in coffee chats and I don't want to have any more coffee chats. So figuring out like what really um, you enjoy because you're going to be better at it. Yes. LinkedIn works very, very well for me. I really like the community on LinkedIn. I think the people are real. I think that they engage a lot. I think it's a lot easier to stand out there huh. um, because everybody's kind of like trying to be professional. So the more real you are, the more you stand out. Like find your place, find your community. I I, I totally agree. I, 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 I'm not a big fan of people saying you have to be everywhere. You have to be on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok. No, you don't really. Where, where is your audience and where is your, your community and where do you add value to, right? I mean, because part of social media, especially LinkedIn is providing value, uh, you know, for, for the people that are on there. So, um, but there are definitely, I, for me personally, I would say I do social. It's not my my love for me. I love speaking. I love networking. I love podcasting. Yeah. I like doing all that kind of stuff personally more than I like just doing a post or something. But to each their own. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have somebody who helps me now, which helps a lot. Yes. So, um, you know, I just give her like the ideas and she kind of runs with them. And that's, I mean, I still have to film all the videos and stuff, but 
I mean, it's one of those things that like, if you are growing a business, you're going to be the face of the business for a while and you got to get comfortable with it. And I will say that whatever you do, you have to be comfortable being the face of your business, like whichever method. It's so interesting. You say that I was in, I've been in many different mastermind groups and, and that is what I see most founders, owners fighting the most is I don't, yeah, but I don't want to do the sales calls. I don't want to do the sales calls. And I'll be honest with you. I definitely have gone through seasons of that. I go in and I go out and then I bring in someone else. But at the end of the day, and especially if your business is is a high majority of referrals, I mean, you they're being referred to you in many cases. Mm-hmm. So, um, but it is that fine line too, because you've got to scale. So you have to have the ability to, you know, you can't be everywhere, but um, I love though that you believe that it is, you, you are your brand and people are buying you you know, even if you're not the one on the calls every single time, it's what, you yeah. Say. I mean, so I have like created and placed salespeople that, that sell people who are the face of their brand in their marketing. So if somebody else is going to sell you, then you just have to have an audience and marketing Market. because otherwise they're going to be like, I don't know who I'm buying. You're going to coach me, but I don't even know who you are or what you're like, like it's a, a hard jump. Right to trust a salesperson that they're not going to be working with on the other end, unless you have all this other stuff built. Totally agree. I love it. All right. So I ask everybody, the show is called The Power of Authority Spotlight. And I always explain it as what is authority? Well, it's, it is based from a book I wrote. And, and the intention of that book was you can't spell authority without author. Obviously, as a published, owning a publishing company, I believe that. But you know, there, that is just one way to build your authority. And so, um, what would you, what is working for you in your business? I mean, I think I've heard a little already, some things you've said, but what has helped you to stand out from all the noise and, and, and be the authority in the eyes of the people you work with? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that my message is so drastically different that it it makes me stand out quite a bit. Um, and the more, up front, I am with that instead of worrying about offending people mm-hmm. has helped. So the whole philosophy of if it's a fit, the people who are offended are not a fit mm-hmm. and that's okay. Don't, I'm glad, you know, you're not a fit because I don't want to work with people who aren't a fit. Yes. Like, I mean, I mean, that's hard because you're like, oh, but I really need the business. But then you do get to a point where you're like, you know, I'd much rather say no to somebody up front than struggle. And then that ruins a relationship, potentially your brand, your, you know, what you stand for. So yeah, I mean, (laughs) that's one of the biggest lessons that I always try to tell people, but I think it's when you have to experience is like some money is not better than no money, right? Because you take on that some money client and it drains all of your emotions and your time and your energy so that you can't get the good clients. However, everybody, I think has to learn that one, like at least three times themselves. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. Same. Me too. Um, so like, for example, in, in one of my posts, like going back to standing out and everything, like somebody wrote on my post, can you not swear in your content? It's unprofessional. And I said, I would just mute me. We're not fit. Like where it's very easy to go into a negative spiral of, should I pull myself back? Should Mm -hmm. I act different? Because this random person decided to give me their unsolicited opinion. And I'm sure that there are other people thinking the same thing. And I hope that they unfollow me. Like, and there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with feeling that way. There's somebody that's going to be a better fit for them. That's more inside the box. That's more prim and proper. And that's great for them. So I, like being able to feel okay with repelling people, mm-hmm. I think is something that really helps you step into your authority. Being able to say, these are not my people and not in a judgy way, just not my people. And to have the strength and and it's discipline too, especially for people pleasers. We want people to like us and we want to serve as many people as we can, but you you can't, you also have to have that strength in, in yourself. I had a scenario, this was years ago. So I, I did a live event called Bookbound for years and years since 2010. And it's just a live event, helping people to write, publish and market a book. Well, my story and the whole basis of like my backstory has everything to do with Zig Ziglar, because like I said, I started working for him right out of mm-hmm. college. There's more to that story too. Anyway, I had um, in all of the times I've done bookbound, our evaluations have been really, really good. I'm so grateful. Uh, they've been excellent. 
and I had one evaluation. I mean, I'm, I'm, mind you, of all the years I've been doing this, one evaluation literally put me in my mental, like, mm. it just, it really crushed me. And, mm. and, it, and it was somebody saying, you know, you, you talk too much about Zig Ziglar or <laughs> his philosophies and all that stuff. And in it, and for, you know, at first I was like, oh my gosh, do I? Wow. I'm, and then it was like, no, 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 this is, I can't change that. That's like asking somebody to change, you know, the name of their child. I mean, it's, it's, it's just part of my story. And if you don't like him, you're not going to like me. <laughs> that's so, true. The other to keep that in mind is like, well, you know, that's that, that point taken. I appreciate your feedback, but um, I'll be mindful of it, but I'm not going to change my story for you for one. Person. Yeah. Also like with negative feedback, because on sales teams, a lot of times you get people saying stuff about the reps, right? Huh. You look for patterns. Mm. If there's, if it's an exception, I'm going to throw it away. Like, I don't care. That's just one person. But if I hear, you know, three or four times, like a similar piece of feedback, it's mm. something I want to think about. Why is that happening? And what can I adjust? Wow. But one off feedback like that about, and it's a little different because it's like about your program and stuff. So I understand you're like taking it, like, I want people to get the impact of this. It's not just like a sales conversation that they didn't like or whatever. So you can't be like, this isn't a fit. Although it isn't a fit if they don't like Zig Ziglar. That's what your whole philosophy is based on. Um, but yeah, I would say like- them To do business together. <laughs> yeah. And like, it, it's just a lot of times when I work with people, there will be patterns. This is not one of them. But if you've gotten multiple times that people said you use too much Zig Ziglar, then in the sales conversation, I would suggest saying, Zig Ziglar is a huge part of my process. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Oh, that's a great way to put that. Are you okay with anything, right? That that this is how we do things. Are you okay with that? Yeah. Like if it's an issue that's coming up a lot, then that's the best way to filter out the people who are not a fit. Yeah. Good. That's awesome. So I know you have a podcast with a ton of great um, episodes and content and all that. So I want to make sure we get people to uh, take a look at your podcast. Again, it's called sales is not a dirty word. And you can go to the link S uh, S N D W dot alicia bar.com and that's um s again n d w and then alicia is a l e a s h a and then b a h r dot com so check out all those episodes yes and specifically i would recommend um how to get better at sales um how to sell like a natural okay. that episode really lays out my philosophy and you can see if it resonates with you i love it I love it. Awesome. Well, I, these shows always go so fast, but any last parting words for that entrepreneur who's sitting there saying, yeah, I have this great idea, this great business. I have a heart to serve other people. I'm just not able to really uh, get over the hump of, of being comfortable sale, selling myself. What would you say to them? I would say that you have to get comfortable. I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> you don't have a business without sales. You have a hobby. And to get comfortable, it really helps to know that you don't have to do anything that doesn't feel like you. So if you feel really awkward in sales conversations, you're, you can say, you know, I feel awkward in sales conversations, but I want to find out if I can help you. Oh. It can just take the pressure off and it can be very endearing to the other person. So keep it real. You definitely need a way to explain what you do in a concise way, which is hard to do on your own. I would recommend working with an expert for that. And as a speaker, if you feel awkward about selling yourself, I don't think you can say I feel awkward about selling myself because speakers have to speak on stage. <laughs> yeah. So you, you have to feel okay talking to people. Um, so really focus on the benefits for the other person. If you're speaking on a stage, you want to say, well, you know, have you had anybody talk about this particular topic? Would that be really valuable for people? And they would say like, this was cutting edge and recommended and come back next year. And like, focus on those things that are going to be a benefit to the other person. And that's all anybody cares about. I love it. I love it. Awesome. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for being on the show. So appreciate it. Learned a lot. And uh, again, check out her podcast. Sales is not a dirty word. Thank you so much, Michelle. You bet. Well, so many good notes here. Um, hopefully you all were, were, you know, had a pen and paper, but just some really key things that, first of all, we're all in sales. If you have a business, you are in sales. 
even if you don't have a business, we're all in sales, we're selling ourselves, but think of sales as service, right? You can't serve someone if you don't sell them what they need. Um, but I love what, what Alicia said about, you know, managing expectations, keeping it real, setting those expectations up front. Don't be, don't be afraid for somebody to say, well, then I'm not a good fit. You'd much rather figure that out earlier than later. Um, be concise and then focus on what people want. They don't want your package. They want the results that your package provides. So that's it for the show this time. We'll see you next time on the Power of Authority Spotlight. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to the Power of Authority Spotlight. If you are a successful founder, entrepreneur, business owner, or leader that's getting results and making a difference, and you'd like to be on this program, please visit performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast to apply. That's performancepublishinggroup.com forward slash podcast. Also, if you got something out of this interview, please share this episode. Just do a quick screenshot with your phone and text it to a friend or post it on the socials. If you know someone that would be a great guest, tag them on social media to let them know about the show and include the hashtag, the power of authority spotlight. I love seeing your posts and guest suggestions. We are regularly putting out new episodes and content, so make sure you don't miss any episodes by subscribing. Your thumbs up, ratings, and reviews go a long way to help promote the show and mean a lot to me and my team. Want to know more? Go to our websites, performancepublishinggroup.com or michelleprince.com. And follow me on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time.